from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Michael Kavna with the Washington Post, the Comic Riffs blog and graphic novel reviewer. Uh, this is, you are witnessing history or part of history because this is the first ever graphic novel night for the National Book Festival. And if you like doing this in this venue and instead of the mall and having this at this cool event at night, uh, feel free to make your voice heard. Uh, and my Twitter handle is at Comic Riffs, so uh, you can go there. But I do want to say, if you are here, this is being recorded, so you may, and if you're here, you may end up uh, on film. Uh, so our next, uh, the person I want to bring up, his name is Warren Bernard. He's the executive director of Small Press Expo, which is coming up next month, September 13th and 14th, here in North Bethesda. It's, an, it's the 20th year. It's an incredible expo. I, I strongly, strongly urge you, if you love comics, especially indie comics, go. It's a blast. Um, and he also is, is key in how we put together this night. He's key in, in with the Library of Congress and the Book Festival. And he was personally responsible for helping to bring Jean Luen Liang and Brian Lee O'Malley and our next guest uh, here. So he's just, he's a force as a comic scholar and as a, net, as a connector of what's important and making sure they come to DC. He's the guy. So let me bring up Mr. Warren Bernard. God, that was embarrassing. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm very happy to be here to introduce Liza Donnelly. Uh, Liza's been a uh, cartoon, cartoonist for The New Yorker for ma many long years. She's part of a power couple. Her and Michael Maslin are the only known married New Yorker cartoonists that there are. And uh, between them, they've done some volumes uh, of, bo of mixing up both of their cartoons. Liza's done 12 or 13 books, I believe, of uh, cartoon compendiums. She's done children's books. She's spoken at the United Nations. She's worked with the State Department with comics. And um, interestingly enough, just a couple of days ago, she was nominated for the uh, Thurber Prize, which is the only prize in the United States for written humor. She's one of three finalists this year. So without any further ado, yeah, give her a big hand. <laughs> Liza Donnelly. Oh, and by the way, her new book, Women on Men. OK, everyone should go and buy a copy. Thank you, Warren. Ben, Michael, uh, the two great um, cartoon supporters. These guys are great. We need to have these, these people, and it's wonderful. Um, and I'm really honored to be here for this National Book Festival. It, um, uh, the Library of Congress is, is something that I've looked up to for all my life, and so it it's just kind of gives me chills that I'm here doing this. And being in historic graphic novels section, um, it's great. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Let me see if I can figure out this clicker. Okay. So um, I'm going to get the handheld, which is where, and, and move down because I can't see the um, screen, and I need to see the screen. So I'm, uh, I'll just start talking. Oh, there it is. Is it? Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm, I'm a cartoonist and a writer, and um, it feels kind of funny to be in the graphic novels section because I'm not a graphic novelist. I do cartoons and I write books, um, but I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> so um, as uh, Warren said, I've, my main home for cartoon, cartooning is the New Yorker magazine. I've been there since 1979 um, drawing drawing single panel cartoons. And I'll show you some examples of my work. I, can you read it? Ice cubes down your back, $1.50. So my, my humor can be kind of silly at times, just you know, meaningless and silly. This, I, I picked this out because we're in Washington and it was supposed to be really hot. I'm in Washington. Um, or uh, also very meaningless and, and stupid, like this one, cat, anyone? I mean, just kind of silly, and I don't even know how I came up with this. Or puns, I sometimes use puns. 
He's saying, who ordered the special prosecutor? So this I did back in the 90s, I think, when Bill Clinton was being special, special prosecuted to death. Do you remember that, any of you? So I, use a, I find a word in the, in the culture and I plug it into a cartoon sometimes. This is, this is a classic example of that. And I sometimes do cavemen drawings too. We have these tools cartoonists use and you can plug things into, into scenarios. Um, he's saying, how about we just go to, to a cave and paint his image on a wall? So it's like making a slight little commentary about creativity, like we're, many of us artists are, are pacifists. We really don't want to confront reality. We want to just go, go to our little caves and paint. So these are some examples of my work. And then there's, then there's the cartoons that are visual, that need to have a visual, um, that, that rely on the, on the artwork. Uh, and this one is an example. It says, she's saying, this woman is saying to her friends, okay, everybody, let's eat before the food gets dirty. <laughs> so you needed to have the setting there, really, to make the joke work. You know, if I'd just shown her and a little bit of the scene, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have worked as well. So my kind of cartoons is a real song and dance between the words and the image. Um, let's see, what's next? And then I do some, some commentary on things that are going on in the culture. The young woman saying to her friend, for my junior year abroad, I'm going to learn how to party in a foreign country. So this was picking up on some, some news stories about uh, kids in college, of course, who just go over to France and drink wine all, all for three months and then get a, get a, a, few, um, a few credits for it. <laughs> so cultural commentary. And then political commentary sometimes. This one is um, uh, the woman saying to the other woman, I didn't protest this war, but I'll try to protest the next one. And this, this cartoon I did during the Iraq war when, uh, I don't know if you remember, when it first started, there were a lot of protests against being involved in that war, and it seemed to become a fashionable thing to do. And I was commenting, making fun of these types of people that would only do that because their friends were doing it, not, not out of conviction. And so my cartoons are often making fun of, of this, this demographic. And then, then there are sometimes I have cartoons that are even more political or more serious. A little girl saying to her father, Daddy, can I stop being worried now? And I did this um, following 9-11, about three months after 9-11, which is, I think we were all feeling that way, like, when is, when is it going to stop? It hasn't, it hasn't stopped, sadly. Um, but basically, this woman's saying, fun can happen to adults, too. So basically, I just do cartoons that are fun. The New Yorker has been known for its cartoons. It was founded in 1925, and it started out as a humor magazine, and it's, it's known, much to the chagrin of the, the fiction people, it's known for its cartoons. People read the cartoons before they read anything else. That's so they tell me. Um, but let me, let me tell you a, bit about, a little bit about how I, how I got to do what I do. Um, I grew up actually here in Washington, D.C. during the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the assassinations, uh, uh, Nixon's resignation, you know, all sorts of turmoil was going on when I grew up down here. And so I think that um, that affected me subtly, like I really wanted to, to do something about the world, you know. And also I felt like I was drawing to try to figure out, try to figure things out. Um, I was really shy and quiet, and this was my way of, of expressing myself. And, and it all started, ironically, because I'm nominated for this Thurber Prize, with this book. This book changed my life. Um, I was homesick from school one day, and my mother gave me a book, um, of, uh, this book, and a, pad of, uh, a stack of paper and a pencil, and I started tracing. I'd been drawing already, but I started tracing James Thurber's cartoons. Anybody know, do you guys know his work? He's sort of become, he's becoming forgotten a bit. Um, but he was, his work is, you can see his drawings, they're very simple and childlike. So for, for a seven-year-old, they're ideal for tracing. Um, so I traced them, and I developed my own style. And I found, this is an early drawing of mine. 
I found that I could make people happy by drawing these funny pictures. I could make my mother happy, my father happy, and then eventually my schoolmates. I could make everybody smile. And I didn't have to, I didn't have to do much. I didn't have to speak. I was shy, so I didn't really want to speak. Um, it, was, it was my way of feeling like I could fit in. I know that I, I heard the, one of the last speakers talk about feeling like an outcast, not being able to fit into the culture, and I felt that way too. Um, and I began to draw and draw and draw and draw, and I, I never looked back. It became my, my, my world. And it also was for me, uh, I felt like an outcast or, or an outsider because I was shy, but also because I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't a girly girl. I didn't want to wear dresses. I didn't want to, you know, wear pink. And eventually I didn't want to wear high heels. But being an artist, I could be who I wanted to be. And the, and the culture sort of accepted me. Oh, she's an artist. That's okay. She can, she can dress like that. <laughs> so, uh, oh, she, you know, m I was able to redeem myself with my drawings and, and feel like I was part of something. And these are my tools. Uh, I use an old-fashioned crow quill pen and, a, and an inkwell. But you'll see later in, in my talk uh, that's shifting a little bit. So, um, yeah, what's this? You're wondering what the heck is this? This, um, I, I went to college, I went to a liberal arts college, and I was drawing all the time. And I, when I was in college, I, my grandmother knew somebody who worked at the New Yorker. And we had the New Yorker around the house, and I started looking at the cartoons and thinking, well, maybe I could do this. Maybe, maybe there's something here for me. So I, I had some drawings, and I wrote this woman who worked at the New Yorker. She was the city reporter. And I said, do you, uh, would you mind showing them to the art editor? And she said, no, no, that's fine. I'll do that. She said, I've been, I've been talking to Lee Lorenz and asking him why there aren't more women in this business. Did he know why that was? Um, and also, he's, she said, he's, he's looking, always looking for new talent. This was in 1974, something like that. And he was a brand new editor there, cartoon editor. And when she said that to me, it's like, it dawned on me, like, a woman cartoonist? I, you know, I just thought I was a cartoonist. I didn't think of myself as a, any gendered cartoonist. And, but it, I think it, it, it piqued my curiosity that maybe, since there aren't many women in the business, maybe I had a chance, that, you know, maybe there was something there. So I started submitting that, you know, that, that, that submission didn't lead anywhere and didn't sell anything, of course. But when I finished college and moved to New York, I got a job at the Natural History Museum. Um, I uh, started submitting cartoons to the New Yorker. And within two years, I sold this cartoon, <laughs> which is a really strange cartoon, and I felt kind of embarrassed about it because most people didn't understand it. And, but I was really, really happy to, be, to, to have sold. It was a dream come true. What it is is a, um, a cone, a sphere, and a cylinder, which is uh, in art. I just finished an art. I got an art degree, so I knew these things. It's Cezanne's three elements in art. So a cone, the sphere, and the cylinder, and a TV set. So, um, so that's the first one I sold. And then uh, this, this was the next one I sold, and this was the first one they printed. And it's a multi-paneled one. The guy's walking down the street, and then he stops, and he thinks to himself, maybe I don't pet dogs enough. And then he turns back around, and he pets the dog, and he walks off. So it's a very subtle and simple and quiet cartoon. My early cartoons are very quiet. And also um, had very few words, my, my cartoons uh, uh, starting out. I was suspicious of words. But then this is the, s the third cartoon I sold. And it's the guy's reading his fortune. And it says, you will find love and happiness and vote for Fritz Mondale. <laughs> this is when, when Fritz was running for president. And everybody was like, oh, OK, Fritz Mondale, OK. Um, actually, the Mondales called the New Yorker to buy this cartoon, and, and th but they didn't end up buying it. And I was really excited about this because when I was growing up in DC, as I told you, uh, I really wanted to be a political cartoonist. You know, I looked at her block and I, you know, I really wanted to change the world, I wanted to help the world, but I didn't think, I don't have enough opinions. Like, that's one reason why I looked to the New Yorker. I thought eventually 
I, I thought I couldn't do the kind of thing Herb Locke was doing, but I, I could do the kind of thing the New Yorker was doing, which is quiet um, pokes at politics. Uh, so when, they, when I sold this, I was on cloud nine. And then here's another example of an early cartoon. It's, it's hard for you to read, but this woman gets on, it's a sequential, woman gets on the tr uh, subway and she's knitting and by the time she gets off, she's, she's knit a sweater and then she gets off it. So. <laughs> the editor at the time, William Shawn, liked, liked sequential cartoons and he liked captionless cartoons. So I was, I was lucky. So let me talk about my books for a few minutes. Um, these are, these are my, my children's books. I don't know if some of you, maybe you've seen them. They were in print in the 80s and 90s. And uh, thank you, that's great. They, uh, they were really fun to do. All about this little boy and his obsession with dinosaurs and his dog. My dog, by the way, his name is Bones, um, was heavily influenced by Snoopy. So I grew up with Snoopy and I didn't think of that at the time, but I looked back and I said, oh yeah, that's Snoopy. Um, they're, back, they're actually being republished on ebooks now, if anybody's interested. You have grandchildren or kids you want to get the books for. And then I did a series of books. The first one, Mothers and Daughters, I'd just given birth to my first child, who was a, a girl, who is a girl. <laughs> and um, I was terrified to have a daughter. I, I just thought, what kind of complications are we going to run into here? <laughs> so I, I thought of this idea to have a book of cartoons about mothers and daughters by women cartoonists. So it's a, it's a collection of, of cartoons by women about their mothers or about being mothers. And then Ballantine Books was the publisher at the time. They wanted to do fathers and sons, so I did that with my husband. And we had men cartoonists doing cartoons about fathers and sons. And then Michael and I said, well, what the heck, let's do one of that were, you would just get the money. So <laughs> we did husbands and wives, um, which was all about marriage by Michael and myself. And then M Michael and I, um, this was in the 90s, I guess, must have been. We did a book called Call Me When You Reach Nirvana, which is all about the New Age movement, if you guys remember when that became popular. It was all about people, um, and now it's more commonplace, people doing yoga and, and burning incense and things like that. And Michael and I also did another book more recently called Cartoon Marriage. Uh, there's a reference, I don't know if some of you cr uh, comic um, nerds out there will see the reference to Crazy Cat there, throwing the, throwing the brick. Um, and that was fun to do, it didn't break up our marriage. It also, this was exciting, this got optioned for television, for a sitcom, <laughs> for uh, ABC, but it didn't, it didn't get picked up, sadly. But here's, one, here's an example of one of my cartoons in the book. Remember the good old days when we faced in the same direction? <laughs> and uh, then with each chapter, I wanted to show you this. Michael and I did uh, graphic narratives. I think this was the first time I'd ever done a graphic narrative. I'm not, I don't quite remember. But we worked on this together. We actually wrote it together and drew it together. So some of the drawings are mine and some of them are his. Uh, our styles are pretty similar. And our sense of, uh, sense of uh, humor is similar too. Although this one I think is, uh, what's this about? Oh, this, this, <laughs> this graphic narrative is about fighting. And this is the one we had the most trouble with, <laughs> writing about how we fight. So um, this next book called Funny Ladies was a big turning point for me, or at least what led up to it was a big turning point for me in my career. In, in uh, 1999, I was invited to be on a panel of cartoonists at the uh, American Association of Editorial Cartoonists annual convention. I'm not a member because uh, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm sort of not an editorial cartoonist, although I think I am. And the panel was all women. I was invited to be on there to talk about why there weren't more women. So I found myself confronted with this fact again and, and started thinking about why, why the heck is this? Why aren't there more women doing this? So. I went to the panel and, and it was, in preparation for the panel, I got to think more about it. But I also was, was on that panel with four or five other women. And I looked out into the room, and the room was a bit smaller than this, but it was packed to the gills. 
and, if, and I looked and I saw that every single person in the room was a man. And it was a visual like, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> this is really bizarre. So it got me to thinking more and I decided to research more and I started looking at the New Yorker and I thought, well, why not look at the New Yorker and see what the situation with women there is? And I went, they have archives at the uh, New York Public Library and I spent some time researching and I found that there were women cartoonists at the magazine in 1925 when the magazine was founded, at the very beginning. Um, Helen Hokanson is one of them. She's saying, I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of hard, it's very sketchy. Evangeline, that is not the way to try on a coat. So, um, uh, Hokanson, as did a lot of the artists at the time, made fun of the older generation. That's what that's about. Um, but there were women cartoonists there in 1925, and there were about eight of them that continued on for the next five to ten years. And then the, cart the women who were drawing cartoons just sort of drifted off or died. And after the um, Depression and after World War II, during that time as well, they, they disappeared. So there were no women drawing cartoons at the magazine in the middle of the decade. And I, I wrote, I mean, I eventually wrote the book. Here's another cartoon by um, Barbara Sherman, who is one of my favorite cartoonists from the time. Uh, it's interesting they put the caption up there. They were, they were playing a lot with the layout of the magazine back then. It's, she says, I don't think he's abnormal. He's just versatile. And I think, this was probably published in 1926, I think, I think she's making reference to homosexuality, which would be very interesting if that's the case. We'll never know for sure. Um, but my theory in the, in the book that I ended up writing, it's a history of the women who drew cartoons of the magazine from, 19, from 1925 to 2000. My theory was that the, in the 20s, there was a more creative freedom for women. There was more openness. and the Women were moving to the city to, to become... To, to go into business, to go work uh, in ways that they hadn't before, and also to become artists. So, and the New Yorker was open to the best artists in town, and some of them were women, so he, they hired the women. Um, and then with the war and the, and the restrictions of, uh, uh, after the war and the conservativeness after the war and the conformity um, in the 50s, um, just didn't give the freedom for women to, to do that kind of thing didn't allow for, the, for women to do that kind of thing, to be funny, uh, for one thing. And um, they dropped off, only to return in the 70s, during the second wave of feminism. Uh, so that's my theory, is that the creativity allowed for, for, and the openness allowed for more women cartoonists. Um, after that book, I did this book called Sex and Sensibility, because I wanted to do something that maybe was a little more uh, mainstream. And this, is a, this was a, a collection of women cartoonists, again, 10 of us, drawing and writing little essays about love and sex. So there's eight, eight of us were from the New Yorker and uh, two editorial cartoonists. And that was fun to do. And then, more recently, this, I did this book, When Did They Serve the Wine, which is going to be on sale out here, I think. Um, after Sex and Sensibility, I began thinking about, I'm still thinking about women and cartooning and women and humor, and I was teaching at Vassar at the time, teaching women's studies, and, 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 and Hillary was running for president, and I'm just thinking about feminism and women's issues, and like, why, and teaching 20-year-olds as I get older, why, you know, if we just communicated with each other, the generations, we could, we could sort of change things, you know, if, if, because when I was in my 20s and I, I became professional, I thought, well, you know, th there's no need for feminism. I believed that in the 20s, in, um, in my 20s. I thought everything's fine. Thank you, Gloria Steinem, we're, we're, we're gonna be fine. And little did I know that that's not the case. So I think a lot of 20 year olds think that. They just haven't, they just haven't had the experience. So if we communicate, with each other and tell each other what's going on and why, you know, what I went through when I was 25, then, then things will get better. So I, I did this book about the decades of a woman's life from birth until um, 60s. This is a, the first cartoon, Where It All Begins, talking about genderization of, of uh, everybody. And then this woman, Mirror Talk, she's saying to herself, if I wear this, will I have trouble in the street? Skirt, skirt too short? Am I showing too much? Why can't I get my legs thinner? Do I look young, fat, silly, hip? Shouldn't have eaten that bagel. So these are the things, if 
I'm sure men do the same, but women do it probably more than men. And then, so this cartoon, I, I just sold this recently to The New Yorker. Uh, she's saying to the, the clowns on the car, still not funny, try jamming yourselves all together into the car. <laughs> um, women are funny. We, we are funny. And for some reason, humor has been a male domain for, for forever. It's changing now. It's really exciting. It's changing a lot. But women are funny. So m my next book... I wanted to do about women making fun, make, uh, being funny, and specifically women making fun of men. So this is what this book is about. And it all started with, with this cartoon, I think. She's saying to him, some wine with your vest? <laughs> this was a cartoon I sold in the 90s to The New Yorker uh, when Tina Brown was editor. And my, this is, I, I didn't realize it, but this was when I began to have this snarky woman's voice. I wasn't aware that I was doing this, but Tina Brown was buying these cartoons. And I look back, retros um, I look back on that and I say, oh, this is where it all started. Um, this woman's saying, it would take more than your pleats to drive us apart, but not much more. <laughs> See, you're laughing. The women, are, are men laughing too, I hope. I had a headache too, but he went away. <laughs> you don't have to go to this party, it's men optional. So I, I, some of these cartoons are quiet and some are a little more ag aggressive. Your chances of hailing a cab are better if you go to the curb. <laughs> I'm sorry, was it your turn to lick the spoon? <laughs> Is it painful? <laughs> Can't you just scramble them? Do you have anybody married to somebody like this? I am. It's like, Always the jokester, can't just scramble the eggs. If you plan to stay in this marriage, sign the pledge not to wear the tie. <laughs> that tie, sorry. This was actually related to something in the news, I forget what it was. Oh, pledges, it was s signing pledges for some, it was not about ties, but. It's too late in the summer and our marriage to toss a beach ball. <laughs> it's kind of sad. It shouldn't, that's not true, that shouldn't be the case. Now, act like you like it. <laughs> I'll be in, honey, as soon as I rake the leaf. <laughs> so this is me commenting on the man. This is not a woman speaking. Most of the cartoons in the book are, are women actually s speaking. I've dated 11 enigmas. I want an open book. So I, one of my favorite things to do is have women talk to each other. I've I decided to marry Frank despite all the warning signs. <laughs> Can you see he's got these things on his, like, slacker, petty, lazy, aloof, drinker, mean, sad. I never date, I, I never date, I'm too niche. <laughs> this is really less about men and more about women. Um, niche, there was a word also being used in the news at the time, I forget what the actual event was. I think I'd look better without you. <laughs> <laughs> There's one in here that's really kind of mean and I, d I apologize ahead of time and that's it, not really, I'm not like that. What wine do you recommend to throw in his face? <laughs> See, the thing with this book is I tried to really push myself to be a little bit more uh, meaty, a little more, because I'm, I'm a nice person, <laughs> but it's, sometimes it's more funny if you push it a, a little bit further. So I, I tried to push it further, and, and there's writing in this book as well, and I tried to, the writing is more autobiographical and, and talking about my experiences. Um, uh, with humor and with men. <laughs> I love the idea of you, but not you. <laughs> oh, no, this is the one. Uh, this, is, this is the one that's, that I preface the, the one I'm going to show you is, I rarely use other people's ideas, but a friend of mine who's a professional writer 
had this idea that he uh, for a cartoon, and he he uh, he gave it to me. He said, "You want to use it?" I I said, uh, "Okay," and I'm not. I, I don't know. It's really. <laughs> you'll see. Some men aren't. Some men aren't deceitful. Some men are dead. <laughs> I did the cartoon, and and lo and behold, the New Yorker bought it, and I'm like, "Oh God, oh no." <laughs> but there are women who talk like this. I'm sure there are. So it's not. I'm not. I'm not the woman speaking. It's. She's a cartoon character. <laughs> I hear men are out of fashion this fall. <laughs> hey, you, let's reduce the gender gap. So I'm trying to, you know, towards the end of the book, I try to be a little bit more like, let's, let's all try to get along. OK, I'll let you win the battle if you let me win the war. So it's about communication. Um, it's really not a battle. But I, d I do want to say, um, this girl saying, Mommy, what did you do in the war on women? <laughs> Remember when that phrase was being bantered about? I don't see it as a battle between the sexes, but I do, s I do see there is, is a war on women around the globe, around the globe and in certain states in this country. Um, so I, as a, as a, as a woman and as a cartoonist, there's a part of me now that feels that I, I need to do this, I need to, to draw about this as much as I can. Just because I think humor is a great way to talk about issues that are difficult to talk about. Because you, you know, you, you, you can present the subject in a way, people are drawn in by the cartoon and then they, then they look at the, what, what's being said and they're like, oh yeah, maybe they'll think a little differently. I mean, I, I'm an idealist, so I, I hope that humor is a great way to start a dialogue. I've used it in my classes. It's a great way to get people to think about something they may not have thought about before. So I do cartoons on women's, women around the globe as much as I can. Issues not just about the United States, but about um, other countries, because also I think that the um, for women politics is a daily thing. It's a uh, it's a we live a political reality. Um, so if you do a cartoon like my kind of cartoons, it gets at the the politics of an issue on a daily basis. It's not about wars necessarily. It's not about leaders or, or battles or guns or, you know, those big issues. It's about a day-to-day -day life that needs to be changed. And I think humor is a great way to do that. Um, this, you, you don't need to read this, but this is an example. I just want to show you that I'm doing a weekly political cartoon for medium.com. They have a great new site. If you're, if you're cartoon junkies, it's called thenib.com. And it's all comic people and some political people. And I do a weekly cartoon for them on politics and, and on women's rights. And it's, it's, gonna, it's always sequential, so I'm doing something different now, uh, a, a weekly sequential cartoon about politics. And um, I wanted to show you this also, because my, my world is changing a little bit with the internet. I still do my cartoons for The New Yorker with pen and ink, uh, scan it and send it in, and they print it on paper. But I also do um, um, iPad drawings, and these are examples of, of iPad drawings I did for the New Yorker during the Olympics. What I do is I react to what I'm seeing on the television, and I just draw it quickly. Sometimes it's caricatures, sometimes it's these kind of things. These are three separate um, drawings that I put together on one page. And then I tweet them out. I tweet out these drawings. And the New Yorker then collects them on, on their website. And that's really fun, and I'm, get, I'm doing that a lot. I did uh, the the uh, the final episode of Mad Men recently for the New Yorker. Um, that's just an example. And I did just the other day. I did the Emmys. Sarah Silverman was there. So it's really really fun, a new thing for me. I do I work on uh, iPad, but I'm also working on a um, um, a Wac Wacom tablet as well. So things are changing in the cartoon world. And then I I yeah. I, I put this on the PowerPoint of me drawing. I'm also using videos on websites, showing people how I draw. Um, because I, I feel like cartooning is a, a very personal medium. And it's a communication between me and, and you about, about what's going on in the world. And 
uh, I love it to use it with social media because it's it's a it goes back to what I how I started doing what I do. It's a way to make people happy. It's a way to talk to people. It's a way to communicate. And I, I just love, I'm just so, feel so fortunate to be able to do what I do. So thank you. <laughs> Quest questions? Two questions. We only have time for two questions. <laughs> okay. Um, I was kind of interested. You did uh, indicate, of course, that uh, uh, Thurber was your first influence, but when you were researching your book on funny ladies, and uh, did you go more than just New York, or did you start looking at other issues of, of women and, and cartoons and such? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, particularly I was interested, because um, I noticed as you were showing the video, I thought of Claire Breck de Oh yeah, big influence thought, on me. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Claire Breck de Yes, I did, in researching the book, I did, I did look further afield as well. And, and in the book, there are some, some little sidebars on other what was going on in comics as well. But there's a woman who writes a lot about comics, Trina Robbins, she writes about women in comics. Um, but yeah, I mean, they sort of mirror each other, the, what was going on with comics and, and political, still not many women in political cartoons for some reason. Yes. Uh, yes, there was something that happened to me once, and I just always thought it would make a good cartoon, and I never told it to anybody. I just thought I'd tell it quite quickly. I was walking together with a girlfriend, and it was a very good time, very romantic time in our relationship, and I, saw, I found a little baby shoe, and I picked it up and put it in my pocket. And she said to me, what are you doing? And I, and I said, it's, it's a nice shoe. I just, and she said, put it down, there's only one of them. And I said, no, I want to keep it. And she said, put it down, there's only one of them. So I put it down and I said, if we have a baby with only one foot, then you'll be sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That sounds more like actually a comic strip because yeah, there's please, several if episodes. You, yeah, yeah, if you can make a cartoon about that, please feel free to. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Thank you very much. You guys were great. I appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.